you feel better, you look better, your blood work is better, your anabolism is better, and your overall bodybuilding journey is better, you're more productive, you're in a better state of health, you're in a better mood continuously, the $200 to $1,500 that you'll spend on it will pay back with dividends, tenfold, I would say. Vigor Steve here with the Mitochondrial Support Stack. Sorry it took so long, it's been a whole year in the making. I had to do a ton of research, a lot of self-experimentation. I spent thousands of dollars trying to piece all of this together. And now that I look back on it, it's not only about improving mitochondrial functioning, it's also about anti-aging and longevity and feeling a lot better, being a lot more productive, optimizing fat loss. So all of the components which are going into this stack, I feel are highly beneficial, but that also means this stack can be quite expensive. So we're going to break all of the costs down as well. Some of the drugs or medications or supplements are nice to have, but not essential for this protocol to work. So we'll discuss all of that during this video as well, which are essential, which are nice uh, beneficial additions and which are, you know, a little bit wishy-washy with minimal scientific evidence, but could still be a worthy addition depending on your preference and your overall goals. We'll discuss all of that in this video. If you like these kinds of deep dives, consider signing up for the Patreon. Videos like this would not be possible without my Patreon. So for everybody that's already signed up, thank you guys so much. The next video, which I'm going to do, the next deep dive is going to be the DHA and Pregnenolone deep dive. Give me a couple days, maybe a week or two to prepare for that. And then we'll go further down the list with all of the deep dives, which I mentioned on the Patreon page, where you guys can actually vote on which deep dive I do next. But before we get into it, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Share this video with a friend who needs a boost in mitochondrial function too, so they can feel 5 to 10 years younger, just like I do. Well, so let's start there. That's exactly how I feel after running this extensive stack, depending on which compounds I'm running. I feel anywhere between 5 to 10 years younger. I'm about 39, 40 years old right now. So I can safely say that I feel approximately 30 years old most of the time that I'm running this protocol. And that's a huge step forward for me, even though I'm aging backwards, basically. My productivity is up. My sense of well-being is up. My overall energy levels are way up. Basically, everything has improved. My bodybuilding has improved. I need to use less performance-enhancing drugs than I did in the past to sustain the same level of muscularity. Most of the enzymatic reactions within my body have now been optimized and function correctly for a person who's approximately, let's say, 30 years old. So all of that combined really improved the quality of my life. But I will say that this protocol, especially at the top level of doing the intramuscular and intravenous administrations, is highly, highly expensive. At the bottom end, like the most basic mitochondrial support stack, you would already spend $200 a month, give or take. And at the higher levels, you'll spend at least $1,000 per month. So we'll break all of that down and discuss that in this video. Don't be discouraged if you don't have that much of a disposable income to improve your mitochondrial functioning. It's still an interesting watch. And again, you just have to keep it in the back of your head. Maybe I don't have 200 extra dollars per month to spend on this protocol right now. But once you become more financially secure and you realize that a mitochondrial support stack could actually be a very worthy return of investment, you spend the extra $200, you feel better, you look better, your blood work is better, your anabolism is better, and your overall bodybuilding journey is better, you're more productive, you're in a better state of health, you're in a better mood continuously. All of the good things you would expect from a protocol like this, the $200 to $1,500 that you'll spend on it, will pay back with dividends, tenfold, I would say. So keep that in mind. It's still, it's an interesting watch for those of you that are not that financially secure yet, just keep it in the back of your head. Maybe one day you'll be able to give this a try. And when you do, you'll feel just as good as I do. So let's start with what the mitochondria actually are. I'm sure you've heard over and over and over again that the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. That's actually the name of a study which first described the functioning of the mitochondria. I'll overlay that right now. Basically, what the mitochondria do is they produce ATP, which is indeed the energy currency of the cell. Your cell needs ATP to survive and fulfill all the physiological functions that that particular cell needs to do within the human body. The mitochondria are actually a separate organism. They're not part of your genetic makeup. The mitochondria have their own circular DNA, so that's actually a circle. Whereas with humans, you have DNA containing X and Y genomes with genes and chromosomes, which all need to be uncurled for normal DNA transcription, resulting in messenger RNA and peptides 
downstream. And the mitochondria fulfill similar functions. They have mitochondrial-derived peptides, which can actually permeate from the mitochondria into the surrounding cell. So even though it's extracellular compared to a mitochondria itself, it's still intracellular peptides because they remain within the cell of the host body. So this is how you have to look at it. The mitochondria are a separate life form with its own DNA that has its own biological functions, one of which is producing ATP. But the host body, the human body, or any other living organism that contains mitochondria, which is the very large majority of the organisms on the planet, they, f they supply nutrients for the mitochondria to function. And the mitochondria, in return, supplies ATP for the host body to use as energy. So it's a symbiotic relationship, so to say. Most of the cells in the human body contain mitochondria, except the red blood cells, for example. But the liver, each liver cell, contains over 2,000 mitochondria cell by cell. So if you look at the liver at its whole, it contains millions, if not trillions, of separate mitochondria, which are all producing ATP simultaneously. So you need to treat these mitochondria with the utmost respect, because without mitochondria, you would really die in a matter of minutes because ATP turnover is very, very fast and it doesn't stay sustained more than several minutes at a time. Now, besides the primary function of the mitochondria to supply the cell with energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate ATP, the mitochondria are also involved in cell signaling. So the mitochondrial-derived peptides can actually end up in systemic circulation and act as an endocrine peptide hormone. The mitochondria are also involved in cellular differentiation, so that's hyperplasia, cell growth, hypertrophy, and cell death, apoptosis. Now, ATP production isn't exclusive to the mitochondria alone. The human body can actually produce a decent amount of ATP by themselves through glycolysis or beta oxidation. With glycolysis, it's a 10-step enzymatic reaction that converts either glucose or glycerol into pyruvate. Glycerol is a backbone that stores triglycerides into adipose tissue. And when you liberate these triglycerides, the glycerol also gets liberated, which is then readily used through glycologists for ATP synthesis. But through glycolysis, there's not enough ATP synthesis for the cell to function normally. So some of the metabolites in the form of acetylcoenzyme A metabolites actually diffuse into the mitochondria to be used in the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, and produce a significant amount of ATP downstream. And beta oxidation breaks down fatty acids into acetyl coenzyme A metabolites as well. These can also be used in the Krebs cycle for further ATP synthesis. For beta oxidation to work, your body requires carnitine for the transport of fatty acids. And the Krebs cycle, which is also known as the citric acid cycle, is a series of chemical reactions that release stored energy through oxidation of the acetyl coenzyme A metabolites formed from carbohydrates, fats, or even proteins, albeit that proteins are really rarely used for direct energy production. In a lot of cases, proteins are either converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis, and the glucose is then converted into ATP or acetylcoenzyme A metabolites through glycolysis, which happens outside of the mitochondria. So pay that no mind. Protein is rarely used for direct energy production. Most Products that go through the Krebs cycle are actually carbohydrate or fat metabolites. Oxidative phosph phosphorylation occurs at the later stages of the Krebs cycle, in which case the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis actually convert and produce the most amounts of ATP in this entire Krebs cycle. Most of the steps on the Krebs cycle are heavily reliant on NAD plus or NADH, and they all occur within the mitochondria themselves. So long story short, when you look at ATP synthesis, what are you going to need? You're going to need oxygen. You're going to need NAD plus or NADH, at which you can supplement NAD plus through supplementation or IV administrations, and carnitine, which you can also take in supplemental form or through IV administrations. And for oxygen, well, all you need to do is breathe. And even the oxygen consumption, also known as cellular or mitochondrial respiration, we can actually manipulate that with some of the supplements, which we'll discuss at the end of this mitochondrial support stack. A fun fact about the mitochondria is that they seem to be responsive to estrogens. And even though the effect of anabolic androgenic steroids has been well documented on mitochondria, which would be a whole separate video just by itself, so we're just going to give that an honorable mention here. All things considering, testosterone has a positive effect on mitochondrial function, and so does estrogen. 
Estrogen actually has a nuclear effect on gene expression within the mitochondria and improves uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, the mitochondrial DNA transcription, and even has a regulatory role in apoptosis of the mitochondria themselves. So long story short, if you want optimized mitochondrial functioning, you need optimized hormone balance. Now, I made several different videos about how to optimize your hormone balance, whether that's in the context of staying drug-free, so that's without exogenous testosterone and other ancillaries in the picture, or actually going on a hormone replacement therapy, that will be a video for you to watch after this one. I'll link that at the end. Still, long story short, improving steroidal genesis or overall hormone balance within the body is highly beneficial for mitochondrial functioning. So for all of the guys that are already on TRT and got their testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone, and estrogens covered, you guys are on the right track. With mitochondrial biogenesis, it's the process of actually producing more mitochondria within the cell themselves. Again, the cell, the mitochondria can't leave the cell and go to another cell. But in cases of mitochondrial dysfunction, where some of the mitochondria actually have their cell membranes burst, these mitochondria can connect to another mitochondria which had their cell membrane punctured or ruptured. They can actually connect together and then two mitochondria can fulfill the same amount of ATP synthesis as one mitochondria. So they don't really self-destruct in this sense. They kind of come together and then continue with ATP synthesis, combining two mitochondria into one mitochondria for normal ATP production. So this is all very interesting, right? Mitochondrial biogenesis is quite complicated, but there's a lot of um, compounds and drugs and supplements and lifestyle practices you can actually incorporate to upregulate mitochondrial biogenesis. So now you have a lot more mitochondria within the cell themselves, producing a lot more ATP. And on the subject of mitochondrial dysfunction, it's kind of a double-edged sword, so to say. Is it the mitochondria that starts dysfunctioning, resulting in aging? Or is it the overall aging of the host body resulting into mitochondrial dysfunction? There's something to say for both, but in most cases it occurs at the same time, because again, the mitochondria are heavily dependent on sex hormones. They're heavily dependent on you providing nutrients. And as you age, a lot of the enzymatic reactions within your body, which is which are dependent on NAD+, downregulate. Your sex hormone production downregulates. Your growth hormone levels downregulate. Your metabolism downregulates. So from all the research that I've done, I would rather say that mitochondrial dysfunction is due to the host body kind of deteriorating with age, not the mitochondria themselves. You're not giving the mitochondria adequate nutrients, adequate um, electron exchange for them to function properly. So if you take care of your health and you follow some general anti-aging protocols, I think your mitochondria should stay sustained far longer than general population. So again, you can't really um, tell your mitochondria what to do, but you can provide them with nutrients and provide them with electrons and provide a scenario with high antioxidant status for the free radicals that the mitochondria produce do not have a negative impact on further mitochondrial function or biogenesis. As long as you do that, I think that the mitochondria are going to reward you and produce a significant amount of ADP in return, making you feel even more youthful. So you can attack it from both angles. You take care of anti-aging and because you're taking care of your anti-aging, the mitochondria will fur further provide anti-aging for you by keeping the ATP synthesis up to par of what you want. Half of this protocol is actually mitigating the reactive oxygen species which the mitochondria are now going to produce when you upregulate them. Again, reactive oxygen species are being produced by mitochondria in ATP synthesis and partially through the beta oxidation and a glycolysis which happens outside within the human cell. So in the turnover of energy, you produce a lot of free radicals requiring you to intake a significant amount of extra antioxidants. And when you look at supplements or even drugs as a whole, all of the supplements and drugs which have a positive effect on mitochondrial functioning are also antioxidants. So you really need to improve your antioxidant profile. Let's say half of this stack is actually improving mitochondrial function and the other half is mitigating the reactive oxygen species. Through antioxidant intake, you need both for everything to work because if you upregulate mitochondrial functioning and you don't take care of the free radicals, you're basically killing off your mitochondria and the cells from within because now you get DNA damage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's definitely 
not what you want. This is why I don't like DNP because DNP acts as an uncoupler within mitochondrial function in producing tons of free radicals. I mean, it's like free radical galore. And even though there's a couple of studies that show that a very low dose of DNP, what was it, 50 milligrams per day, can actually have a beneficial effect because now you improve how you how your body responds to this reactive oxygen species. So you get a little bit of an adaptive response, even though that study shows that it might have some anti-aging effects. Um, why bother? You know, there's better ways to lose fat, better ways to increase your body temperature, um, much better ways to improve anti-aging parameters. And if you want to improve your, well, reactive, uh, reactive oxygen species and get some sort of adaptive response out of that, all you need to do is follow this protocol, but you'll feel significantly better than running any dose of DMP for anti-aging purposes. But before we start optimizing, let's discuss all of the medications which are known to have a negative effect on mitochondrial functioning. And it could be through a lot of different pathways. It could be through mTOR one or two, could be through the MP kinase pathway, or actually a destruction or negative effect on the mitochondria themselves. It's been a very long road to piece all of that together. So if you see some of the medications or drugs that you're currently taking on this list, I would highly advise you to do additional research because I can't spend another six months diving into every little performance enhancing drug, every little medication, every little drug, and their unique negative or positive effects on mitochondrial functioning. So long story short, in this list of notes, is that um, sodium valproate has a negative effect on mitochondrial functioning. So does metformin. So does uh, fluvoxamine, fluoxetine, citrulline, and many of the other antidepressants. So I'm happy I already discontinued fluvoxamine. But what I can say is that running fluvoxamine or not running fluvoxamine on this mitochondrial support stack, I didn't notice any difference. I've run metformin on this mitochondrial support stack. And even though I don't really like metformin because it reduces my overall workout performance the next day in the gym, or if I use it every day, my workout performance basically goes down to 75%, which is certainly not what I want. Um, adding metformin or fluvoxamine in doesn't mitigate, doesn't undo any of the benefits you'll get from a mitochondrial support stack just like this. But if you're going towards the cheaper end, with just a couple options which we'll discuss, and you're on metformin and fluvoxamine and some of the other drugs in this list, maybe it won't be as effective. So keep that in mind. Antipsychotic medications like heliperidol, blood thinner medications like warfarin, even diuretics like furosemide, Lasix, heart medications, propanolol, nabivolol, all have a negative effect on mitochondrial functioning to a certain extent. Um, cholesterol and lipid lowering medications, so that's the statins like a resuvastatin, atorvastatin, simvastatin, um, acetamide actually has a positive effect potentially on mitochondrial function, but that's further down the line. Pain medication, ibuprofen, naproxen, um, aspirin, paracetamol, the diclofenac, Celebrex. Man, all of these have a negative effect on mitochondrial functioning. And even nicotine, from what I was able to piece it together, doesn't have a beneficial effect on mitochondrial functioning. But that could be because nicotine has both pro-oxidant and antioxidant effects. So it depends on which entry into this um, mitochondrial function regarding nicotine you actually adhere to because nicotine is quite well documented, but I wasn't able to find that much conclusive evidence that it either has a positive or negative effect on the mitochondria. Even lidocaine, um, which most people won't really have access to unless it's in the form of cocaine, keep in mind, it has a negative effect on mitochondrial functioning. I did not really dive into how recreational drugs affect mitochondrial function. And again, I can't go through the entire water doping list and see if it has a positive or negative effect on mitochondrial functioning. So if you have an exclusive stack and this mitochondrial support stack is not working as expected, maybe go through down, down the list and then type in the medication or the drug or whatever that you're using, the supplements, type in mitochondria and start researching by yourself to see if it has a positive or negative effect on your mitochondrial functioning. There's a lot of supplements, over-the-counter supplements, which have a positive effect on the mitochondria. Alpha-lipoic acid, arginine, berbenine, carnitine, which we'll discuss in this video, citrulline, including citrulline malate, coenzyme Q10, ubiquinol and ubiquinone, which we'll also discuss in this video, creatine, uh, most of the B vitamins, niacin, riboflavin, thiamine, 
um, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin K, resveratrol, most of these, actually I'll put it on the screen right now, most of these potentiate their positive effect on mitochondrial functioning because they're very potent antioxidants. So that's mitigating some of the free radicals, which the mitochondria produce, especially when you upregulate their functioning. I quickly want to highlight berberine. Not only does it increase its overall insulin sensitivity, it could potentially act as a D-peptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor and um, prevent the breakdown of growth factors like insulin, IGF-1, epidermal growth factor, or growth hormone or releasing hormone, increasing growth hormone levels downstream. A berberine is a very versatile compound. It was shown to increase sirtuin 1 levels and contributes to mitochondrial biogenesis, but apparently long-term high dosing can also cause mitochondrial toxicity. Now, I wasn't able to determine what the actual dose is of berberine that would cause mitochondrial toxicity. So for me, I would run maybe 500 milligrams of berberine in the morning. And on days that I have a cheat meal or a high carb day, I would run 500 milligrams metformin before bed. So I'm restoring insulin sensitivity the next day. And for overall mitochondrial functioning, I would limit it to a protocol similar to this. 500 milligrams berberine upon waking or before bed, not 1500 milligrams berberine for longer periods of time to improve your insulin sensitivity because it might be deleterious to the health of your mitochondria in the long term. And the same with metformin. Metformin has been shown to have a negative effect on the mitochondria. So you want to use that sparingly if you're interested in improving your overall energy levels. And again, if you're overdoing the metformin, well, you'll be met with all kinds of intestinal upset issues that no matter how many carbohydrates you eat, it's basically all passing through and you're not going to get full or get any form of glycolysis for ATP synthesis and energy levels further on. So use these compounds sparingly, guys. You don't need to make a dose of berberine and you don't need to make a dose of metformin for anti-aging purposes. It might actually be counterproductive. And of course, creatine monohydrate is very potent in the regeneration of adenosine triphosphate levels with reactions that involve the breakdown of phosphocreatine. Now, there's a multitude of studies that show that creatine is very beneficial to restore mitochondrial functioning, protect against the structural damage of the mitochondria, reduce oxidative stress, and reduce the impact of mitochondrial DNA mutations. The documentation on creatine is endless, probably the best scientifically researched supplement out there, including on mitochondrial functioning in that context. So why not supplement it, right? Five to 10 grams per day. It's very cheap, highly inexpensive. And you will get a couple extra reps and improved ATP synthesis out of it. I guarantee it. The B vitamins help with the overall metabolism of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Niacin specifically increases nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide level, whether that's oxidized NAD plus or reduced NADH. Of course, these are substrates for the electron transport chain, which is part of the oxidative phosphorylation further down the Krebs cycle. Riboflavin, vitamin B2, is a major component of flavin adenine dinucleotide and flavin mononucleotide, which also serve as electron carriers in the electron transport chain. And thiamine, vitamin B1, actually is a cofactor in pyruvate production within glycolysis. So thiamine supplementation can actually help with ATP synthesis, albeit to a certain extent, because again, glycolysis doesn't yield so much net ATP. Now regarding resveratrol, even though there's a decent amount of scientific evidence that shows that resveratrol supplementation acting as a very potent antioxidant can help with a mitochondrial function and improve mitochondrial biogenesis because apparently a resveratrol increases sirtuin 1 levels and AMPK levels. Um, I didn't notice a difference. So I supplemented with resveratrol at various dosages um, over months. Didn't make a world of difference to me. I tried several different brands, several different dosing protocols. I'm not going to include it in the mitochondrial support stack simply because I didn't feel a difference. I didn't feel that it made any sense adding this in for the costs that resveratrol goes for nowadays, but feel free to add it in. If you get a benefit from resveratrol or you find your unique combination of particular supplements and you notice a difference, then by all means, supplement it in. I'm just not going to discuss it because for me, it didn't work. What did work is just a general recommended supplement stack, which is a B50 complex twice per day to supplement an adequate amount of B vitamins to your diet. Again, your diet should contain some B vitamins. Hopefully, you're eating healthy 
and um, you're cooking all of your meals, etc. Uh, vitamin C, a thousand milligrams with each meal, because it acts as a potent antioxidant. And again, when your mitochondria are upregulated, you need to increase your overall antioxidant status. Vitamin C also helps with carnitine production and collagen synthesis. Don't get me started on how oh, vitamin C blunts the post-exercise stress response, and now I'm not going to get any swollen than I already am. <laughs> Train a little bit harder and don't overcomplicate it. If you're really worried about vitamin C, you're probably just a shit bodybuilder or a shit person in the fitness industry. And if you want to use that as an excuse, there's the door. Get out of here. Vitamin E, twice per day, 200 IUs, morning and evening. Vitamin K, once per day. I go with Gerald Formulas. It contains about 2,200 micrograms vitamin K. Vitamin K1, um, 2, MK4, and MK7. So those are the general recommended supplement stack. A couple honorable mentions, like I mentioned before, testosterone and most of the other anabolic energetic steroids improve mitochondrial functioning, cell survival, membrane potential, reduces nuclear fragmentation of the mitochondria and the production of reactive oxygen species. So assuming that your testosterone levels are sustained, let's say a um, quarter or to the top of the reference range or over it, you're now improving mitochondrial functioning. Um, steroids have an overall positive effect on the Krebs cycle, resulting in an increased ATP synthesis. I'm sure everybody can attest to this, that when they're on a heavy cycle, you eat a meal and a little bit later, you start sweating, especially Trimbolone is horrible for that. Again, I didn't run every anabolic androgenic steroids through the search function of how Trimbolone or Nandrolone or Winstrol or etc. Um, affects uh, mitochondrial function separately. So if this video does well and you guys would like to see it, and you vote for it on Patreon, I'm willing to do the research and see how each anabolic androgenic steroid affects the mitochondria separately, whether that's in a positive sense or negative sense. For now, I would say that testosterone and some of the other steroids have a positive effect on the mitochondria, but of course, further experimentation and further deep diving is required to really piece all of that together. Tomasartan increases mitochondrial ATP synthesis significantly increases mitochondrial function and exhibits anti senescence activity through the AMP kinase pathway. Now, besides the overall positive effect that telmosartan or angiotensin receptor blockers have on blood pressure management in your overall vascular system, telmosartan also improves endothelial functioning. So technically, that means that telmosartan can increase nutrient delivery to the mitochondria. Now, estrogen also has a positive effect on the endothelium by acting as an antioxidant. And so does vitamin C. So if you keep your estrogen sustained and perhaps supplement with tomosartan and a high dose of vitamin C, your endothelium is perfectly healthy and all of the nutrients that your mitochondria require will transport freely from the bloodstream into the cell and further into the mitochondria. And of course, some of the mitochondrial derived peptides can then transverse back through the cell, back into the systemic circulation for an overall beneficial effect. So again, all of these things highly contribute to your health and mitochondrial functioning. And azetamide might actually increase mitochondrial functioning, but only in hyperlipidemic patients, in which case azetamide significantly increases mitochondrial oxygen consumption, membrane potential, glutathione content within the mitochondria and the cells, and decreased levels of reactive oxygen species in ATP synthesis. Now, it's unsure if azetamide has a similar effect on mitochondria and otherwise healthy patients. What I can say is from all of my research and how uh, meldonium works, which we'll discuss a little bit later, the mitochondria can actually accumulate fatty acids. And when there's a lot of fatty acids within the mitochondria, uh, cellular respiration and the production of ATP actually goes down. There's not enough oxygen that enters the mitochondria because it's full with fatty acids and some of the carnitine metabolic waste products which are now stuck within the mitochondria. So I feel that either meldonium or azetamide can actually improve these conditions. There might be something to say for combining both of these if you feel that you've lost insulin sensitivity and um, overall ATP synthesis because your mitochondria are now misfunctioning due to the you know high amount of fatty acids which are contained within. So again, that's a little bit hard to pinpoint sometimes, but in these unique circumstances, perhaps combined with fasting, a combination of azetamide and meldonium might actually be highly beneficial to restore mitochondrial functioning and improve the overall health of the mitochondria in cases where there's severe hyperlipidemia. 
I've used peak ATP, which is basically oral ATP that you can take as a pre-workout. Um, I can say that you get a phenomenal pump because ATP acts as a potent vasodilator, not as potent as AMP, adenosine monophosphates, but even oral ATP or injectable ATP all act as a very potent vasodilator and increase the overall enjoyment of your workout. Now, I've discussed peak ATP and Amino Asylum Stampede and Super Shredder in previous videos, so I'll link them at the end of this one. Um, they could be a nice add-on, but in the overall picture of improving your productivity, your well-being, and your energy levels, they contribute basically nothing. They're mostly used in the context of improving your workout performance, getting a better pump, getting better contraction, getting a better um, energy production, and maybe gaining a couple reps along the way in a similar sense that creatine uh, monohydrate can add a couple reps on your max bench or max effort lift. And I've also tried Alev ATP, which is a new supplement on the market that is part of some pre-workout cocktails that supposedly is able to increase uh, endogenous levels of ATP production within skeletal muscle. It's an extract of Asian peat and apple polyphenols. Didn't do anything at any dose. I've mega dosed Alev ATP and compared to peak ATP, does absolutely nothing. Compared to Amino Asylum Stampede or Super Shredder, which contain injectable ATP and AMP, does absolutely nothing. So LF ATP, you could just write off, take it from me, just a waste of money. It's a fancy product that some supplement companies like to use, um, but from my personal experience, doesn't contribute a single thing. Good, with all of that out of the way, we can finally get into the mitochondrial support stack, shall we? Starting with Ubiquinol. I've talked about ubiquinol many times before on this YouTube channel in the context of taking that in supplemental form pre-workout to boost exercise performance. I think I introduced this about two years ago. I've had a lot of reports from you guys saying that you take 200, 300, 400 milligrams ubiquinol pre-workout and reporting that your exercise performance has improved substantially. Now, in those previous videos, that was just a top-level explanation. So let me give you guys the deep dive about ubiquinol right here. Ubiquinol is the hydrogen-reduced form of coenzyme Q10, which is said to be more potent regarding mitochondrial functioning and ATP synthesis compared to its oxidized form, which is ubiquinone. Now, ubiquinol donates two electrons in the redox chain, which is the reduction and oxygenation of different compounds. And when it comes to mitochondrial functioning, ubiquinol contributes to the proton pump electron transport chain as part of the later stages of the Krebs cycle for oxidative phosphorylation where a lot of ATP synthesis actually occurs. And because ubiquinol can donate two electrons in the redox cycle, it's also a very potent antioxidant which is required to support mitochondrial functioning because again, the mitochondria produce a decent amount of reactive oxygen species. So not only does ubiquinol support ATP synthesis, it also reduces oxidative stress, which again is required to, to optimize mitochondrial functioning. Coenzyme Q10 is actually found in many different food sources, albeit that we don't know how much ubiquinol or ubiquinone each food source actually contain. When we look at a reindeer meat, you see that it contains 157 milligrams coenzyme Q10 per one kilogram. And when you look at beef, pork, chicken, or fish, you can see that the heart or the liver generally contain a lot more coenzyme Q10 compared to some of the other organs or the actual animal meat. So that being said, are we going to supplement our ubiquinol needs with eating heart and liver? You would need to eat between two to six kilos of pork heart to get, let's say, 400 to 600 milligrams of coenzyme Q10, and then you still don't know how much ubiquinol or ubiquinone you're actually getting in. So I would prefer to go the supplemental route instead of eating that much organ meat to get you know, somewhat of an adequate amount of ubiquinol in, um, and that's certainly easy to digest as well. Now, fish contain a decent amount of ubiquinol, especially the heart of a herring. I don't know anybody that prefers to eat the heart of a herring. You would just eat the herring, the meaty part. And, uh, mussels contain, and some other aquatic meats contain ubiquinol and ubiquinone. Uh, dairy products contain coenzyme Q10, and even peanuts have a decent amount of coenzyme Q10 per kilogram. I do know that frying food lowers the potency of coenzyme Q10 between 14 to 32 percent. So I would say that the supplemental route is the best route. Silicid fulvic acid is known to improve coenzyme Q10 and ubiquinol absorption. So personally, I would take 250 milligrams silicid fulvic acid with each serving 
of ubiquinol supplementation. So if you take 100 milligrams ubiquinol in the morning, 100 milligrams in the evening, and let's say 100 to 400 milligrams pre-workout, depending on your financial situation and how much of a mitochondrial support effect you want out of your ubiquinol supplementation, that would be 250 milligrams shilajit fulvic acid, let's say two times to three times per day. And then because we're increasing the mitochondrial function within the heart, you also need to increase your taurine intake. Taurine is very prominent within cardiac muscle as well as in the testicles. So why not take supplemental taurine for all its beneficial effects and also to remove those um, disgusting lower back pumps and shin splints, right? I already made a separate video about that. I'm sure you can find it on my YouTube channel. So you take your ubiquinol, your shilajit fulvic acid, and then taurine you can space out over the day if you don't want taurine to mitigate your pumps. During the workout, you take 1,000 milligrams with each meal, or you can take 5,000 milligrams of taurine pre-workout. This stack alone is tremendous for cardiac functioning, especially regarding the functioning of your mitochondria and energy production resulting in the highest amount of ATP synthesis you could possibly get. But wait, there's more. There's a lot more supplements what we can discuss. Next on the list is Parolo Quinoline Quinine, abbreviated to PQQ, and that's how we're going to say it going forward, because Parolo Quinoline Quinine is almost impossible to pronounce. 20 milligrams once or twice per day to help with mitochondrial biogenesis. Now, the scientific evidence regarding PQQ is a little bit thin, I would say. It's thinner than resveratrol, but whereas with resveratrol, I don't really notice a difference. With PQQ, I would say that there's a noticeable effect. And I can also see that on my blood work results, PQQ actually can increases my serum creatinine levels. So that will be an indication that something is going on, whether that's a negative effect regarding um, increased creatinine production and, and burdening my kidney, so to say, or an increased ATP synthesis downstream. I would lean towards that because I get a noticeable effect. And well, we also know that creatine monohydrate can raise serum creatinine levels. And that also has a beneficial effect on ATP synthesis. So with PQQ, it basically acts as an enzymatic cofactor within bacteria, similar to how B vitamins act within the human body. And a human study showed that PQQ was able to reduce inflammation and improve mitochondrial function and efficacy, which was based on urinary metabolites. PQQ is also known to activate sirtuins, SIRT1 and 3, which are involved in mitochondrial biogenesis. These genes, again, are heavily dependent on NAD+. So if you go with PQQ, you also need to increase your NAD plus concentrations either through NMN supplementation or NR supplementation or through IV NAD plus administrations. Again, more on that later on. Now, again, resveratrol supplementation might increase mitochondrial biogenesis through SIRT1 activation and the increase of AMP kinase activity. But from my personal experience, supplementing resveratrol up to a thousand milligrams per day, I would say that 40 milligrams PQQ regarding the overall effect on what I feel in my body is a lot more effective. I didn't know anything from resveratrol, trying a multitude of different brands. And the only two brands that I've tried of PQQ, whether that's 20 milligrams or 40 milligrams, I do notice an increased effect. And again, I can see that on my blood work results. PQQ can also be found in several different food sources. The highest concentrations finally can be found in human breast milk. Human breast milk contains between 140 to 180 nanograms per milliliter. That's a combination of PQQ and IPQ. IPQ stands for imidazoloprilocoinoline, which is a derivative of PQQ when it reacts to non-branched chain amino acids. So that's not the leucine, isoleucine, or the valine, but all of the other amino acids. So that's a derivative of PQQ. We still don't know the exact ratio between PQQ and IPQ in human breast milk. But if you do some simple calculations, you would need at least 220 milliliters of human breast milk to get 40 milligrams of a combination of PQQ and IPQ. Is that worth it? Maybe to some it is. Fermented soybeans, natto, also contain a decent amount of PQQ. And then you can see it on the list. And even though PQQ supplementation is considered to be quite expensive, it's still cheaper than getting your wife pregnant for a steady supply of, let's say, a year or a little bit longer of human breast milk, which you're going to have to share with your son or daughter. Right? So I don't think that's a suitable approach. You can eat a ton of natto and still not get an adequate amount of PQQ, which you would want for mitochondrial functioning and biogenesis. So the supplementation route is the way to go. And that brings us to carnitine. And whether that's injectable carnitine or oral L-carnitine L-tartrate, that's entirely up to you. 
the dose of injectable carnitine is going to be significantly lower compared to oral L-carnitine L-tartrates, but injectable carnitine burns like a mother. So keep that in mind. Your injection sites do get used to this injectable carnitine over time. So if you repeatedly inject around the same area subcutaneously, then after a while, the injectable carnitine doesn't burn as much as it did in the beginning. I feel that 500 milligrams subcutaneous injectable L-carnitine once or twice per day is more than sufficient. Now, before you start asking or quoting studies where carnitine has been shown to reduce thyroid function or thyroid conversion, Keep in mind that's only at higher dosages, not at the dosages that I'm recommending. 500 milligrams injectable carnitine is not going to negatively affect your thyroid function in any way, shape, or form. If you really want to reduce thyroid storm, you need 2,000 milligrams injectable carnitine. And if you take 2,000 milligrams oral L-carnitine L-tartrate, because it has such poor oral bioavailability, you're not going to get the same effect. Plus, if you take oral carnitine, you're going to space that out over the day because injectable carnitine and oral carnitine both need a little bit of insulin to be properly absorbed into the cell for the mitochondria to use for beta oxidation. So again, if you're going to carnitine route, you can either take that before activity, 500 milligrams before the workout or 500 milligrams before fasted cardio, for example. Skeletal muscle contraction is a actually able to absorb carnitine in a similar sense that you can absorb creatine through this pathway. And otherwise, a very small insulin secretion using branched-chain amino acids, being leucine or isoleucine, which are also is insulinotropic, or you administer a low dose of rapid-acting or fast-acting insulin, either subcutaneous or intramuscularly, that's, let's say, one to two IUs, before the workout or before fasted cardio, again, to help with carnitine absorption into skeletal muscle. That's entirely up to you. Whether that's 5 grams of BCAs, 10 grams of essential amino acids, or a little bit of insulin, that's your decision. Personally, I don't see any benefits of taking injectable carnitine either intravenously or intramuscularly compared to subcutaneous administration. Sub-Q gets the job done perfectly fine. Again, it is beneficial to take injectable carnitine sub-Q over oral L-carnitine L-tartrate because now you don't have a risk for TMAO formation within the intestinal tract and the liver. Um, again, you know, if you want to get rid of the bacteria that produce TMAO, you can do a course of doxycycline, which is only has to last for two to three weeks in duration. So don't overcomplicate it. And again, a low dose injectable carnitine regarding its bioavailability, especially when combined with an insulinotropic agent, um, is certainly preferred over a high dose of oral L-carnitine L-tartrate. If you don't want to inject in this protocol, we go with the oral L-carnitine L-tartrate. And it brings us to nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, one of the more expensive supplements in this mitochondrial support stack, but it's essential to run it because this is where I notice the most amount of benefits. If you only have to choose one supplement in this stack, it would be NMN based on my personal experience and the experience that I've had with all of my clients, my wife, and everybody that I've talked to. Now, in the anti-aging community, there's a huge debate between what is more effective, nicotinamide riboside or nicotinamide mononucleotides. One of the key arguments is that NMN needs to be converted into NR before it can permeate the cell membrane after which it converts back into NMN. That's because the structure is actually quite similar. NMN has an added phosphate group compared to NR, which increases its molecular size. Um, so some scientists believe that NMN is too big to permeate into the cell membrane and others say that it's no issue. And that's why they believe in NR supplementation instead because NR gets phosphorylated into NMN before NAD plus biosynthesis occurs. So some scientists say that you only need NR. Other people say that you need NMN because it's the direct precursor of NAD plus. I experimented with both various different brands. Every time I took NR up to 1200 milligrams per day, I got a minute effect compared to a low dose of NMN. Now I've supplemented between 250 to 1,000 milligrams of NMN per day, that's either with NAD plus administrations or without it. And I can say that NMN by far, by far is a lot more potent regarding overall energy levels and overall sense of well-being and the productivity um, aspect of this mitochondrial support stack compared to NR at any dose. So you can take my personal experience and, and that I have with some of my clients that NMN is far superior compared to NR. Again, this NMN, NR, and NAD plus field of anti-aging is a huge 
minefields, I would say, um, a lot of hidden agendas, a lot of these anti-aging clinics, which um, have their own preferred practice because they can mark up the NMN or the NR or the NAD plus quite substantially. Luckily, NMN is at least available as a supplement, but NAD plus, which we'll get into a little bit later, that's very hard to come by and, and ridiculously expensive. So if you can't afford NAD plus, a higher dose of nicotinamide mononucleotide upwards of a thousand milligrams per day is certainly going to be beneficial. Now, NMN is a nucleotide derived from nicotinamide riboside or vitamin B3 niacin. Apparently, NMN converts into NAD plus within minutes of ingestion. So multiple doses per day are generally recommended. Personally, I take 175 milligrams NMN with each meal over the day. And if you decide to go with, it can actually afford intravenous NAD plus administrations on a weekly basis, or you have access to Mod C, which is the mitochondrial derived peptide, which we'll discuss in this video, or 5-amino-1-MQ, which is a nicotinamide N-methyltransferase inhibitor, which prevents the breakdown of nicotinamides. So the NAD salvage pathway stays sustained. If you can combine all of these, you'll need less nicotinamide mononucleotides compared to running NMN solo. So the daily dosages of NMN could range anywhere between 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams. I even know people that run 2,000 milligrams NMN per day because that's their sweet spot. Again, they don't take NAD+, Mod C, or 5-amino-1-MQ. So throughout this entire process, you'll have to experiment a little bit either with NMN, building up the dosages, then maybe switching for NR further down the line and see which dose and which compound actually gives you the best effect. I would advise still everybody to supplement with a B50 vitamin complex to get adequate amounts of B vitamins in because you need these B vitamins to help with carbohydrates, fat, and protein metabolism, which ultimately contribute or acquire NAD plus to fulfill all the biological functions that contribute to overall energy levels and sense of well-being. So again, a little bit of experimentation is required here or there. It's going to cost you a decent amount of money to actually figure that out. But once you figure it out, all you need to do is follow that protocol through and you should feel pretty freaking good the entire duration that you're running this mitochondrial support stack. These supplements are purely there to increase NAD plus levels. So that also means you need to increase your overall antioxidant profile. You can do that with injectable glutathione or N-acetylcysteine, which converts into glutathione downstream. You can combine that with SEM-E, S-adenosyl-L-methionine, which is a supplement that increases glutathione content within the liver specifically. Now, again, you don't know how much NAC converts into glutathione. And you don't know how much SEM-E contributes to, liver, to glutathione content within the liver. This is always the difference between supplemental form um, relying on the body to convert that into the compound or um, metabolic pathway that you want compared to injectable NAD plus or injectable glutathione. So for me personally, having experimented with all of the supplements by themselves and experimenting with the supplements as well as the injectable routes, I would say that a combination is highly beneficial. But of course, that's not for everybody because not everybody wants to inject um, intravenous NAD plus or intravenous injectable glutathione or subcutaneous carnitine or MOTC, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So that's entirely up to you. Um, from my personal experience, I would say that a combination of intravenous NAD plus combined with oral nicotinamide mononucleotides um, seems to yield the best results. NAD plus concentrations are the highest within the mitochondria themselves, constituting anywhere between 40 up to 70% of the total amount of NAD plus which is present within the cells. The mitochondria use a specific membrane transport protein to diffuse NAD plus over the mitochondrial membranes and then keep it there for energy production. Intercellularly, NAD plus has a half-life of approximately one to four hours, whereas within the mitochondria, it has a half-life between four to six hours. Oxidized NAD plus and reduced NADH phosphorylated NADP and the reduced phosphorylated NADPH are all essential for enzymatic reactions, metabolizing one biological molecule into another one. Without NAD and its four constituents, enzymatic reactions would not be possible. So as you get older, supplementing with NMN or NR or NAD+, intravenous administrations becomes even more essential compared to at a younger age, at which point you kind of feel that you're unbreakable anyway. 
But as you get older, all those enzymatic reactions and all these uh, ATP synthesis metabolic pathways um, seems to downregulate. And if you want to keep that going, NMN supplementation, NR supplementation, or NAD plus supplementation, highly beneficial. That could be anywhere between 250 to 500 milligrams NAD plus on a weekly basis or 250 milligrams NAD plus IV twice a week. On the lower end, you could even do 125 milligrams NAD plus intravenously once or twice per week. That's already better compared to taking nicotinamide mononucleotide in supplemental form at very high dosages, let's say 1,000 milligrams to 2,000 milligrams per day. Because again, nicotinamide and adenine dinucleotide is what you want. The nicotinamide mononucleotide or nicotinamide riboside are just building blocks for the NAD plus that you're going to need to fulfill all of these enzymatic reactions and contribute to ATP synthesis within the mitochondria. So I would say that it's essential, but it's also highly expensive and not available everywhere. I'm in a very luxurious position where I have access to NAD plus from a clinic or a pharmacy or a hospital at the highest quality I can get here in Thailand. I have a private nurse who administers 250 to 500 milligrams NAD plus on a weekly basis. But again, if you have to go to an anti-aging clinic or a hospital to get this done, you might get set back between $150 to $250 per administration. Now, it usually includes the service, the 500 milliliters normal saline solution and all of the injection material that you're going to need for IV administrations. Many of the clinics, as what I do myself, I combine NAD plus with injectable glutathione or amino acids, vitamin C, B vitamins. Some people prefer to combine that with injectable carnitine because, again, they don't like the uh, subcutaneous carnitine administrations on a daily basis. So they just do that intravenously once or twice per week. So again, this IV cocktail is entirely up to you, what you can source, um, what options they offer at the clinic or the hospital where you're doing these IV administrations. And again, if you're doing it yourself and you can source all of these drugs um, individually or in combination through a reliable uh, reseller, so to say, um, yeah, the costs are still going to be up there. So keep that in mind. If you go the IV administration route, it could add another 700 to maybe even $1,100 to your monthly mitochondrial support stack bill. Now, to upregulate mitochondrial function further, what I already alluded to several different times in this video about the mitochondrial-derived peptides, is actually one of them out there, which is highly beneficial that you can actually purchase online. MOTS-C, also known as mitochondrially encoded 12S ribosomal RNA. Now again, MOTS-C is a peptide derived from the mitochondria themselves, it plays an important role in metabolic function of the human cells also. It's an endogenous or endocrine hormone that the mitochondria produce that can actually diffuse into systemic circulation and potentiate some effects into other tissues of the body. The benefits of MOTC have actually been well documented, albeit that all of the studies that have been performed on MOTC have been in rodent models. So keep that in mind, all of the results that I've read show that MOTC treatment is actually highly promising. It's been shown that MOTC can have a beneficial effect on age-related diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, postmenopausal obesity, and even Alzheimer's. MOTC treatment could potentially reduce aging-related mitochondrial metabolic dysfunction. MOTC can improve insulin sensitivity on skeletal muscle and improve glucose homeostasis in the bloodstream, improve fat metabolism through the activation of the AMP kinase pathways. MOTC is also an important regulator of energy balance and amino acid, carbohydrate, and fat metabolism. MOTC actually triggers the activation of the AMP kinase by accumulating ICAR, which I didn't get an opportunity to try in exogenous form, not to be mistaken for acetyl L-carnitine. This is ICAR, which is um, used in doping to improve endurance. I wasn't able to source it. I would love to run ICAR in combination with MOTC, but we'll have to wait if that experiment ever takes place because all the sources that uh, present ICAR to me um, are unfortunately sold out. So stay tuned for that experiment. Um, MOTC regulates ATP and ADP, ATP and AMP ratios, and it also improves the overall antioxidant response to reactive oxidant species within the mitochondria and the cell themselves when they're under oxidative stress. So not only does MOTC improve mitochondrial functioning, it also upregulates the response to this 
uh, reactive oxygen species. And this way, it keeps mitochondrial functioning and biogenesis sustained because now these reactive oxygen species are easier to be mitigated with antioxidants. So if you put all of this together, upregulating mitochondrial functioning and upregulating this uh, antioxidant response and antioxidant status with everything that we discussed in this stack, I mean, it basically means that everything is functioning correctly, but at a much higher level. That being said, Mod C is also highly expensive. So it's a bit of a luxury. I've noticed that Mod C supplementation or injections basically leveled up my stack with, man, if I have to quantify it, 50% more benefits, I would say, regarding the overall energy levels that I have, my overall focus, um, the benefits that I have regarding my cognition and overall fat loss or anabolism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? I feel that my stack has leveled up quite substantially by the addition of five milligrams Mod C twice per week. I want to give you guys a fair warning about Mod C. A lot of people experience an allergic reaction. Now, I've only had the opportunity to try two different brands from my compounding pharmacy and one of the sources that I was able to find online. I don't think there's so many manufacturers of Mod C. So this allergic reaction can occur at the site of administration, especially when you do subcutaneous administrations of Mod C, whether that's 2.5 milligrams or 5 milligrams in one cc. Um, it almost looks like cellulitis. It looks horrible. It's like bubbly and red. And the first time this happened to me, um, I honestly thought I had an acute allergic reaction or a severe infection, but it seemed to dissipate within an hour or two. And what I've noticed is if I do Mod C 5 milligrams or 2.5 milligrams very close to a subcutaneous carnitine administration, so let's say a couple inches from each other, this seems to exacerbate the effect. So what I do nowadays is administer Mod C intramuscularly, 2.5 milligrams bilaterally in the outer quads. So that's 2.5 milligrams left, 2.5 milligrams right, both in one milliliter solution. So that's a little bit more diluted to mitigate some of this reaction. And then an hour later, after the Mod C has been absorbed into systemic circulation, I do my 500 milligrams carnitine injection subcutaneously. I might still get a little bit of a rash, a little bit of an allergic response, but it's severely diminished. And I've also done my subcutaneous carnitine administration an hour before intramuscular Mod C administrations, and it seems to yield to the same effects regarding the reduction of this allergic response. So keep that in mind, um, even though I'm getting my Mod C from a compounding pharmacy and I highly believe into the quality of their product, um, this is an allergic reaction you can expect. It's well documented on Reddit from the people who've also used Mod C. Again, so spacing your carnitine away from your Mod C seems to mitigate this to a certain extent. But if you only use Mod C and you don't use injectable carnitine, um, then you might still get an allergic response. So please keep that in mind. It will dissipate within an hour or two. So that's, you know, a little bit of a side effect you have to look past. But otherwise than that, besides the cost and this little side effect, I would say that Mod C is highly worth it. And then the last thing you can do, even more expensive than things we mentioned previously, is the inclusion of 5-amino-1-MQ. 5-amino-1-MQ inhibits the methylation of nicotinamide within adipose tissue. It doesn't inhibit methylation within the liver, which is the primary source of methylation of a lot of biological compounds. 5-amino-1-MQ solely acts within adipose tissue, preserving nicotinamides for the NAD plus selfish pathway, which increases overall nicotinamide mononucleotides, NAD+, NADH, NADP, and NADPH concentrations within adipose tissue, all resulting in an increase in overall fat metabolism within the adipose tissue, allowing you to lose body fat easier, especially at the later stages of contest prep, when uh, fat loss some starts to become more cumbersome and uh, more resilient, the more pharmacological <laughs> interventions you throw at it. So 5-amino-1-MQ is solely there to improve fat loss during a cutting phase. You can add that into this mitochondrial support stack to help with the NAD plus selvage pathway within adipose tissue and potentially other organs or other tissues of the body as well. Albeit that I can't really find any conclusive evidence that 5-amino-1-MQ is able to increase NAD plus concentrations or glutathione concentrations or SAMe concentrations anywhere else besides adipose tissue. So again, a lot of these compounds haven't been thoroughly examined in a multitude of different settings. 
what I notice with 5 amino 1 MQ supplementation is that besides the improved fat loss, is that um, energy levels also increase. And I've heard this from several other people that co supplement NMN with NAD plus and 5 amino 1 MQ as well as MOT C. So if you put all four together, um, man, it's basically nicotinamide NAD plus heaven for your body. Um, that's why I feel 10 times younger energy wise, because, well, all of my NAD dependent enzymatic reactions within my body are firing on all cylinders. And then there's four compounds, which I'd like to discuss in this video, but the deep dive I'm going to save for an upcoming video about how to maximize your endurance. So it's not necessarily for strength and muscle building, but solely a video to optimize endurance, whether that's for cycling or for MMA, that video will solely be dedicated to how to get the most out of your body endurance wise. These four compounds are all produced in Russia or Ukraine. I would classify them as selective mitochondrial function modulators, the SMFMS compounds. Those are bimetyl, mildronate, um, hypoxin, and Mexibo. Basically, long story short, they're all anti-hypoxia medications with characteristics of adoptogens and nootropics. Basically, they improve physical performance by altering mitochondrial functioning, whether that's in glycolysis pathways or Krebs cycle pathways. They reduce the overall oxygen consumption in the production of ATP. And this way, you can actually get more out of the physical performance without increasing oxygen demand. This also means that you have less reactive oxygen species that are being produced for this increased physical performance. Now, again, I want to save these compounds for a separate video. I'm still going to put them on the screen with my recommended dosages and my experiments over the last couple of months because I do think that they're highly beneficial. Personally, I prefer Bimetil once per week before leg day. That seems to potentiate the best effects regarding that strenuous workout with a little bit of nootropic properties allowing me to push to failure and beyond towards the end of the workout. And I also really like meldonium, also known as meldronate, which actually shifts the energy production from oxidizing fatty acids to oxidizing glucose within the mitochondria. It does so by inhibiting carnitine synthesis. So combining meldronate with injectable carnitine or oral L-carnitine L-tartrate kind of defeats the purpose. You would need to use meldonium separately. And this way, the oxygenation within the mitochondria shifts to glucose, requiring less oxygen, increasing the overall ATP output and reducing the reactive oxygen species that way. And it can also mitigate some of the metabolic issues which are associated with hyperlipidemia, particularly when combined to azetamide, which I alluded to earlier in this video. Now, again, I will do the deep dives when I finally get to this topic of how to increase endurance. I would advise you to keep these compounds on your radar if you're interested in improving mitochondrial function because all four manipulate mitochondrial function to a certain extent. If you're unsure of which of these adoptogens you would like to try as part of the mitochondrial support stack, I believe that Cosmic Nootropics actually has a adoptogen bundle with 10 or 20 tablets of each of these drugs so you can actually experiment with them and see which ones you like the most before you make your final purchase and buy a box or five because you really like that particular adoptogen. So head over to Cosmic Nootropics. I have a discount code for them, Vigorous10, to get 10% off. It's probably the best deal you can find anywhere on the internet regarding these Russian or Ukrainian made adoptogens, which again, manipulate mitochondrial functioning. Give that a try, give that a look consider them for future use. I personally enjoy taking them. Um, I would say that they contribute a little bit as part of the mitochondrial support stack, but they're mostly there to improve overall endurance. And especially if you're into endurance sports, I would really look into hypoxin, mildronate, bemetil, and mexibol in a much greater extent. Keep in mind that mildronate, um, meldonium is already on the doping list. And I believe that Bimetil is also on the watch list. So if you're competing in drug tested federations, well, you better stay clear. Okay, let's wrap it up. What I'll do is I'll make three separate protocols and put them on the screen right now. A budget oral only stack where you only have to take supplements in oral form and not spend too much money. I think if you take a B50 complex, vitamin C, vitamin A, E, vitamin K, ubiquinol, shilajit, fulvic acid, taurine, PQQ, nicotinamide mononucleotide, N-acetylcysteine and oral L-carnitine L-tartrate. 
you'll already get a significant benefit out of that. Again, it's a very heavy supplementation stack, but I can almost guarantee it that you will notice a difference for the better. And for the guys that are a little bit more advanced, have a little bit more disposable income, that you have the B50 complex, the vitamin C, the vitamin E, the vitamin K, ubiquinol at a higher dose, silicate fulvic acid, taurine, PQQ at a higher dose, nicotinamide mononucleotide, n acetylcysteine including SAM-E, oral L-carnitine, L-tartrate, and 5-amino 1-MQ. This protocol is almost twice the price, but will yield a much greater effect because you're taking particular compounds at a higher dose and preventing the breakdown of nicotinamide um, through methylation in adipose tissue. And then there's a pro-intermuscular intravenous stack, which again contains all of the supplements, ubiquinol at a higher dose, nicotinamide actually at a lower dose because now your 5-amino-1-MQ intake is so high that you don't need so much supplemental NMN. Um, n acetylcysteine is there, SAM-E is there, um, IV NAD plus is there, as well as injectable glutathione, injectable vitamin C, and injectable B100 complex, all once per week, perhaps twice per week, if you can actually afford that. And then you take 5-amino-1-MQ to prevent the breakdown of nicotinamide mononucleotides uh, to a certain extent in the adipose tissue. This protocol, including MOTC twice per week, um, yeah, will be very expensive. They can run you upwards of $2,000 per month. So I'll really leave it up to you which compounds you want to try, which ones you feel are worthy of continuous use. You will have to experiment a little bit to see which protocol yields good results and then which additions yields uh, greater results, albeit that it might not be worth the price. Experimentation is required. It's all up to you whether you start with uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide as the sole source of a supplement to improve mitochondrial function and the enzymatic reactions which occur within the body through the NAD uh, pathways. That's entirely up to you. I feel it's highly beneficial. Um, I'm going to run most of these compounds continuously after coming off cycle and into the near foreseeable future. Um, but I will still have to do additional research to see which of these compounds might have a negative effect on fertility. And even though I'm on a ton of antioxidants, again, oxidative stress within the testicles are not very conducive to your fertility levels. That's probably the worst on your fertility besides keeping your testicles at a very high temperature, which is also not very beneficial for your fertility. Okay, I'll leave it here. I hope it was helpful. I hope some of you guys can get a benefit out of this protocol, whether you start low or go on the, you know, the mega pro IV and intramuscular stack. That's up to your budget, I suppose. For now, we're out of time. I'll leave it here. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope it was educational. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. A front double bicep for you guys, full with NMN, full with NAD+, Mod C, and all of that good stuff. Man, even though I'm getting smaller because the testosterone is leaving my system, um, I still feel pretty freaking good. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.